I love that. It's so amazing to hear about middle school and high school students giving generously of what, you know, little they have to send elementary kids to camp. And that's, that's amazing because to me that just shows that, man, God is working here. Cause that's not a normal thing. I don't know if you're a, if you're a teenager, you know teenagers. Um, that's not a normal thing, uh, you know, just to give, to give away for any of us. Really, I mean, that just challenges me. Like, man, where's my heart at in being generous toward God and, and towards the kid that kids that God's entrusted to us? So, anyways, I am so excited to to be here today to to, to preach to share God's word together. Um, my name is Shane. I'm one of the Connect Group pastors here. Richie is with his wife and little girls. They're spending some family time together. They're going to be back, um, I believe, tonight. They're get back in town. But really, I mean, they're investing time with their family and they're on vacation, so they're going to be back with us. Miss them terribly. I know a lot of times I'll get up here and, you know, and razz Richie about his cool hair, about his, you know, hipster clothing. But uh, I, I want to be serious this time. Is that, is that cool? Is that all right? Okay. Um, really, Richie is a man that has invested so much in me personally. He has helped me become the man that God's called me to be and learning to lead myself, lead my family, and lead in the church. And I just appreciate his investment in me so much. And I just want to take this opportunity while I got the microphone to just honor him and, and to thank him for his leadership. Well, we got some work to do this morning. Um, the guy who preached last service went way too long, and so that's why we're late. And so I'm sorry, I'm going to try to get us through. So I need your help, though. So if you would kind of lean in and engage with me, because we're going to be moving, okay? And I don't want to lose you. I don't want to leave you behind. Um, but there's a lot in this passage. God has been, like, just kicking my tail all week with this. It's awesome. And now you get to share that experience with me. I hope I don't know if that's inspiring or not. But anyways, would you pray with me? Because really, I want to pray from my heart that God would really lead me during this time and that God would soften every single one of our hearts to, to really to hear what he wants to say to each of us this morning. So I'm going to pray and ask that you would pray with me. Jesus, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for your love for us. God, thank you for your grace. God, I just pray that your grace would cover me now, God, that you would give me words to speak, God, words that are from you, God, not from myself. God, that you would, uh, God, allow us to, to have hearts that are soft right now that um, want to listen, God, want to be shaped and molded and changed, God. We want to get to a spot of being uncomfortable to where we have to change, God, because we want, we want to be the men and women you're calling us to be. God, we don't want to stay where we're at, God. So I just pray that you'd use this time to encourage us, inspire us, equip us, challenge us to grow as your disciples, as your followers. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, grab Bible, Bible app, open up to John chapter 7. We are going to be in uh, about the middle of, middle of the chapter, starting in verse 25 today. Last week, you can go online if you missed it, uh, Richie and Greg uh, preached together, and they preached on the passage right before this. Basically, uh, Jesus is, is in the temple. He's at this large gathering called the Feast of Booths, and there's probably hundreds, thousands of people gathered while he's speaking. So I mean, you got to imagine, I mean, even more people, way more packed than, than what we're experiencing right here. And there's so many people packed in, in around this festival. And he's standing up and he's starting to, to talk. And he's talking about, you know, hey, if you seek to, to know God's will or to do God's will, you're going to know for yourself whether or not my teaching is from God or from myself, from the Father, or I'm just making it up. And then the, the Pharisees are getting to this spot where they're um, not really liking what Jesus is doing. He's kind of messing with their nice and neat religious system. And they're, they're starting to, you know, kind of push back on that a little bit. And in their resistance to what Jesus is doing, as he's trying to show them who God is, really, uh, that, you know, he gets to a spot where Jesus says, hey, you know, don't judge by appearances. Like, judge at the heart level to make an accurate judgment, to make an accurate call. Actually, look, look at why I'm doing what I'm doing. So not just look at what, but look at why and the words that I say with it. So that's kind of where we pick up this morning. I'm going to read the passage uh, that we're going to be in today. It's uh, verse 25 all the way through 36. Would you read this with me? Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, as he taught in the temple, you know me, and you know where I come from? But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true. And him you do not know. I know him, for I came from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? 
The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. Right at the beginning of this passage, we see that uh, the Jewish people are, are confused and uncertain about who Jesus is. There's, there's a lack of clarity. Like, hey, you know, I thought this was the guy that religious leaders are trying to, you know, shut down and, and make him be quiet and, and, you know, arrest him or kill him. But he's speaking, they're not doing anything. So there's a lot of, a lot of confusion in, in, in this moment, in this tension. I just want us to enter in to the confusion, kind of this uncertainty. So I think for a lot of us, we face uncertainty in our lives. We face confusion. We face chaos in our lives. The question is not if, but when. I mean, think back to the last moment in your life you felt uncertain about something. Maybe it's this morning. Maybe it's right now. Maybe uncertain about how long is this guy going to keep talking. But whatever you're uncertain about, just, just picture that. What's your mode of operation in that moment? And I want to write down this first blank. Who are you listening to? In times of uncertainty, times of confusion, times of chaos, who are you listening to? Some of the voices that kind of enter in uh, to our minds, I think, during these confusion, confusing, uncertain times are um, myself, my, my own selfish nature, what I want, what feels right to me. And a lot of times, this is how it comes out. In a moment, I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, doubting something. I'm, I'm confused about something. And the way it will come out where I typically can identify that's myself, my, my, my selfishness, is I'll say, I feel fill in the blank. And it's like my, I'm being driven by my emotions. Not that emotions are a bad thing. Don't, 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 don't hear me in that because I'm actually, you know, you got feelers and, and thinkers. I'm, I'm a feeler. My first response is how I feel about something. So you thinkers look at us feelers as like irrational and, you know, n- you know uh, unpredictable. And we feelers look at you thinkers as like heartless robots. And I mean, but anyway, so I'm, I'm a feeler. So I'm not saying emotions are bad in that. I don't want you to hear that. But emotions can lead us astray. The Bible actually says that our hearts are, are, are wicked and, and desire contrary than what the Spirit of God desires. So we have the Spirit of God living in us if we're believers and that we still have this, this selfish nature that battles against it. So I'll say, I feel, and right away I'm like, uh, that's probably me, not God. So what are those voices you're listening to? Or there's the world. Kind of the, the economy of the world is very contrary to God's economy. The world says, hey, whatever, again, whatever feels right, right? Whatever you want, whatever you need, just do whatever it takes to get it. So I'm having some conflict in my marriage right now. Oh, well, just, just start over. Just find, some, you know, find a new one. Kind of trade them in, right? Get the, get the newer model. Or you know, things with my, my kids are really difficult right now. We'll just let them do their thing. You just do your thing. They'll, they'll kind of figure out. They'll find their own path, right? I mean, these are kind of what the world says, again, contrary to what God's word says. And there's the people in our lives. And we all have people speaking into our lives. Not all of us are willing to listen, but we have people that are speaking into our lives. Okay, think about who are you allowing to speak into your life? And are those the best people to be speaking into your life? What I mean by that is this, is that, you know, if I, if I wanted, a, you know, an opinion on, you know, what to, to do about my knee that's injured, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go to someone that doesn't specialize in the human body, right? I'd go to a doctor that can tell me what's going on. Well, if I'm trying to discern God's will for my life, lights on, lights off. If I'm trying to discern God's will for my life, I'm going to go to someone who, I know it's going to point me to, to Scripture, going to help me in the uncertainty, help me in the chaos, help me in the confusion to know, man, what, what's this about? What, how, do I, how do I proceed? How do I follow God in this moment? What do I do? Ultimately, we need to look at God's Word. God's Word ultimately is the source of truth, and we need to look at God's Word to, to discern in moments of confusion, moments of uncertainty, what's going on. The, the, the piece, though, the critical piece is, is our motive and how we approach God's word. Do we have a complete picture of God's word? Because in this story, the Jewish people said, you know, hey, this can't, be the, this can't be the guy. This can't be the Christ we were waiting for because we know where he comes from. But, you know, one of the prophets said that, you know, we're not going to know where, where the Messiah comes from. Well, the fact of the matter is that's, that's actually not what was said in scripture. You look back to Malachi 3, the, the verse they're talking about, the, the first verse of Malachi 3, and it says that uh, the Lord will, will suddenly appear in his temple. And so they took kind of this suddenly appear to mean that we're not gonna know where he comes from. 
And it's like, no, wait a minute. That's, I mean, look at the rest of scripture. Isaiah 7 says that the virgin will be with child and that she will give birth to a son and he will call him Emmanuel, meaning God is with us, talking about Jesus. Or look at uh, I, um, Isaiah chapter 11, where it says that he will be called a Nazarene, which means he's gonna grow up in Nazareth. This is his hometown where he's gonna grow up. Or Micah 5, that says he's gonna be born in Bethlehem. That's why Mary and Joseph had, you know, had to go to Bethlehem. Yeah, it was because of the census and what they had to do, but ultimately God was leading them to make sure that prophecy was fulfilled. So you look at all these holistic view of scripture and like, no, Jesus is going to, to have a, a, a birthplace. He's going to have a family he's going to grow up in. I mean, he's, he's, he's fully God, yes, but he's also fully man. And he had this, this incomplete view of scripture. I think for us, when we have an incomplete view of scripture, it's, uh, it, it can quickly lead to a slippery slope. What I mean by that is we can uh, look for scripture to justify our feelings you know, if I'm feeling a certain way, I want to find a scripture that kind of supports the, the bitterness that I'm holding on to in my heart or the unforgiveness that I just won't let go of. I want to find a scripture that justifies that. So I'm, I'm coming with my conclusion already decided and saying, God, prove my conclusion. It's a pretty arrogant spot when you think about it. And really in that moment, you know, we, we, we kind of pick and decide the, the scriptures we like, the, the ones we're comfortable with and the ones we don't like. Here's an example, like the ones that talk about, oh, God's love, God's grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, serving each other. Oh yeah, let's, let's preach on that all day long, right? I'm, everyone's good with that. Even people that don't follow Jesus, they're good with that. Talk about God's love all day long. No one's gonna get mad at you. But the second you start talking about, well, the Bible says to, uh, you know, abstain from sex outside of marriage. Or it talks about, you know, I mean, as we're giving our lives away in response to what Jesus has done for us, that we give financially, generously to the mission or when it talks about you know uh, stay married you know even even when it's tough when there's conflict to that God's heart is that we stay as one or when it talks about repenting from sin and actually turning from our sin turning towards God actually changing that's uncomfortable right Uh, I'm going to stay away from those books in those areas and in those moments we really quickly become editors of God's word not followers or doers of God's word. Really in that moment, you might as well take a pair of scissors and start cutting out the pages you don't like. Because in our hearts, in our minds, what we're doing. We, we kind of chalk it up to, well, that passage, that was probably cultural just for that time when it was first, first written. It's not like it's for us here today. Really? Because the Bible says or about itself that it's living and active and that it's useful in every situation for, for teaching and encouragement, and rebuke and correction. That's what the Bible says. And so we can quickly make ourselves editors of God's word. And God, God doesn't need editors of his word. He, he desires followers of his word. He desires people that are submitting to his word and being changed by his word. How are you approaching God's word? We know this approach not only with the right heart, but re- recognize that it becomes part of our daily routine, our daily habits, our daily lives. That you take a, a theme, something you're going through, you're experiencing in life and discover I want to know what God's heart is about this topic. It's like in, in Walk in Obedience. You look at the list of topics there on your notes. Those are just a few. You know, if you're looking for marriage and parenting, um, getting to know who Jesus is, dealing with conflict, um, comfort in times of hurting, you see some passages here that you can start to look to discover what God's heart is. It also becomes part of our daily discipline, our daily routine of discovering God's heart that we talk about this 21 day, it takes 21 days to establish a new routine, a new, a new habit. 21 days doing the same thing to make it part of, of your lifestyle, really. And so a few weeks ago, we talked about starting this 21 day challenge of 21 days in a row, uh, spending time uh, reading God's word and time in prayer. That might be, uh, you know, a paragraph, might be a chapter, might be a couple of verses, and then prayer, asking God, God, what are you speaking in this part of your word, what are you trying to reveal to me? And what, 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 are you, what are you showing me in, in this moment? Help me to see that. I love it. There's a guy I'm getting to know. He's in my connect group. And, and he started this, this, this 21-day challenge. He's like, hey, I want, I want to start that. You know, I've been kind of spotty here and there. I kind of read the Bible occasionally when it's convenient. I'm not a big reader. So, you know, it's, it's hard for me just to sit down and do it or whatever. He goes, but mine's going to be a little bit unique. And I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? He's like, well, you ever heard of this game called uh, Candy Crush? I'm like, no, no, I never had. And this, you got, you got, I got to paint the picture, okay? I missed this part. He's, this guy, he's, he's a big military guy. He's a pilot out at Fairchild. You know, a big, I don't know, he's like 6'2". I don't know how much, but his muscles are like, 
huge, and, and I look really scrawny, scrawnier but, but beside him. And anyway, this guy like, is a big man's man, big tough guy, right? And he's like, I'm like, Candy Crush, I was not expecting it to come out of your mouth, I gotta be honest with you. And so I asked somebody else, like, hey, have you heard of this game called Candy Crush? And the guy's like, oh yeah, my nine-year-old daughter uh, plays it. So anyways, I'm not, I'm not judging this guy at all, I don't, I don't want you to hear that, but anyways, he said, you know, mine's gonna be a little bit unique, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop playing Candy Crush, because I rec- recognize I'm spending a little bit too much time playing Candy Crush, and I'm going to instead kind of replace that with time in God's Word and prayer. Like, that's probably a good swap. That's, that's, that's good. That's a good idea. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I love it. It's probably the first time I've ever heard anyone doing a, a, a fast from, from Candy Crush, but if you're looking, you know, for, for an idea of what to fat, you know, that can be something for you. But I love it because it's three weeks ended, and, and uh, it was last Monday. We were having our group, and it was day 21, that day. I said, hey, man, what do you, what do you think? You, you know, what, what do you think about this 21-day challenge? Are you going to go back to playing Candy Crush? He's like, Nah, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I, I, I like this routine that I'm in now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep spending time in God's Word and keep growing in that and, uh, you know, try to limit the Candy Crush time there. So I just love that. Here's a man in our church. One, he's, he's being honest. You know, he's being real about his Candy Crush addiction. But uh, more importantly, he's learning. He's seeking to discover who Jesus is and what God's heart is for his life. And that's really in this story that people were seeking to d- discover who Jesus was, but they were stuck on this question, where does he come from? And I think they thought, like, wait a minute, we know this guy. I mean, that's Mary and Joseph's son. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a carpenter. We know, we know this guy. And this kind of familiarity in our hearts can kind of breed this complacency with Jesus. Like, oh, yeah, I know Jesus. Yeah, I grew up hearing about that. I grew up in church. Or, yeah, my parents told me about him. Or, you know, and it's just, but for me, the more I realize that, you know, the longer I'm, I have a relationship with Jesus, that the more I realize, the more I come to know who he is, the more I realize there's so much more about him. And I'm like, oh man, there's this, there's that. And that's so much deeper than I thought it was. There's so much more. He's so much bigger. In this moment, they're seeking to, to discover who Jesus was because ultimately they thought they knew the day and the place of his creation. But really they only knew the day and the place of his human birth. They thought they knew really who his parents were, but I mean, they, they knew who his, who, who his mom, who birthed him, but they didn't know who his father was. They thought they knew. And Jesus is trying to tell them in the moment, like, you guys think you know? You think you know where I come from? You have no idea. You have no idea. And the tension continues to build in this story. Write down this for the second point. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. Verse 30 to 32, we, seek that, we see that there's, there's people kind of on, on both sides of the, the line here, that there's some that are seeking to arrest Jesus. Shut him down, get him quiet. But it says at the same time, there's, there's other people that are coming to believe in him. And what's amazing about that is there's, the Bible says, I mean, there's not anyone in the middle. It's like they're either adamantly opposed, wanting to arrest him, or they're, they believe in him. They believe that he is the Christ, the promised one they've been waiting for. I think what's amazing about that is that you look back and see that Jesus doesn't really leave us a whole lot of option, a whole lot of wiggle room, a whole lot of a place to stand in the middle. Really, he doesn't. Because when he makes statements, you know, when he heals a man on the Sabbath and, and makes a statement making himself equal to God, it's a pretty big statement, right? Or when he, when he says that, you know, the father has entrusted him, the son, to, to give life or to execute judgment earlier in John. That's a, that's a big statement, right? And these statements like this, these are just pretty controversial. And you're either, you either like adamantly oppose Jesus or you believe that he is who he says he is. There's not really a middle ground there. And Jesus is confident in who he is. That's what I love. In, in the end of John chapter 6, when he makes a statement that in order to have life, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Talking about communion, but people didn't realize he was talking about communion. And it says everyone left, except for like 12 guys. That's not a very good ministry. I mean, Jesus, you're not doing very good, right? You only got 12 guys, really? I mean, come on. You need to step up your game here a little bit. But I mean, really, I, I mean, he doesn't like chase after him like, whoa, 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 no, wait, come back. I'm sorry. I take it back. I apologize. No, he's saying, this is who I am. I'm trying to show you who God is. I'm trying to show you the heart of God. You've been so stuck in your religious system, the rituals, what to do, what not to do, that you're missing my heart. I'm trying to show you that I have come to set captives free. I've come to give sight to the blind, to heal the lame and the sick, and to bind up the broken heart. That's who God is. I'm trying to show you that. And I want you to have relationship with me. But I'm not going to change who I am to make you comfortable. This is who I am. This is who God is. He's trying to show us who God is. Who do you say Jesus is? There is no middle ground. Last point. 
You fill it in here. Jesus' kingdom is spiritual. His kingdom is spiritual. Jesus goes on to say, I'll be with you a little longer and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Jesus said to one another, what does this man intend to go that he will not find him? Is he going to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying you will seek me and you will not find me and where I am, you cannot come? So they're still thinking literal, like physical time and place, right? They're saying, oh, he's going to go like to, to the area where the Greeks are and there's some Jews living there and you know, they worship in synagogues and he's going to kind of go there and teach them, right? And Jesus like, you guys are totally missing it. My kingdom is spiritual. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, he says in John 6, 63. Jesus says that he is going to him who sent me. He's saying he's going to be returning to heaven to be with the Father. I love when he says that, you know, you will seek me, but you will not find me. You know, he says, after I'm gone, I'm going to return to the Father. You're going to keep looking for the Messiah, the Christ, because you didn't think I was, I was it, but you're not going to find me because I'm right here. You don't recognize me. I think in our lives, we, we spend this time looking for these saviors, looking for the things that are going to give us hope, joy, purpose, peace. You know, it might be the, 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 the perfect family or the, the perfect job or you know, the perfect number when we can finally retire and do what's going to make us happy. It might be the perfect relationship, you know, uh, romantically speaking. It might be the per- perfect relationship with our, with our parents that was always broken or with our kids that just, you know, it's never been the same. I mean, it might be these ideals that we drum up saying, oh, when that happens, everything will be good. And Jesus is saying, I'm the only one that can give you the purpose you're looking for. I'm the only one that can give you the hope, the joy for eternity that you're looking for. You're going to continue to seek after these other messiahs, these other saviors. But I'm here right now. And what's amazing, the hope for us, is that we didn't, we didn't miss him. Jesus is still alive and well today, reigning, ruling from heaven. And he is here today saying that, don't miss me. Don't, don't chase after these other wannabe messiahs, these other things that might temporarily make you feel good. Like, I am here right now. Press into me. Trust me. Believe in me. Jesus wants us to have an eternal perspective. I love, again, just his confidence in, in this story. You know, he knows the religious leaders want him gone, want him to, you know, he's messing with their system, right? And he says, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go pretty soon. Um, you know, and then I'm, gonna, I'm going to him who sent me. You, you, you will seek me, but you won't be able to find me, all that. I love when he says, I'm, I'm going. Don't worry, I'm going. But you... No other man is going to tell me when I go or how I go because I'm obeying the Father, all right? I'm, I'm, on, a, I'm on a different mission that, that's way bigger than what you can see. It's way bigger than this physical material here and now. I'm establishing a kingdom that is spiritual that is going to advance in people's hearts, a kingdom that is eternal, never ending. He says, I'm going to go. I'm good and ready. Once I get my guys ready, when they're, when they're ready to carry on the church after I'm gone, I've still got people to heal. I've still got miracles to perform. I've still got to go to the cross to pay for the sins of the world. So I'm going to go. Don't worry. I'm going to go when I'm ready. Jesus wants us to have this eternal perspective. If you are here today and you do not know Jesus, my heart is for you. My heart breaks for you, not because I'm, I'm in, in no way better or above at all. I'm not, I'm not saying that. My heart breaks for you because I was, I was there. And I, I still remember what it's like to be lost. To, or I, I remember what it was like to, to, to kind of lie to myself and say, yeah, life is good. I'm, I'm good. I don't need anyone. I don't need any help. I remember that. I remember I got really good at lying to myself too. And so when I say my heart breaks for you, God has given me purpose and joy and freedom beyond what I could even ever hope for. I'm not talking about like material things like he's, you know, I'm not talking about this health and wealth gospel where he, no, none of that. I'm talking about what he's given me like just in relationship with him and with his people and, and, and my marriage with such an amazing wife I mean, with, with, with brothers and sisters in Christ that, man, just love each other. That, oh man, that just cared for us during the darkest times in our life. I want you to have that. I want you to experience that. We're going to close 
today here in a few minutes and, and we're gonna have people up front that would love to pray with you about beginning that relationship with Jesus. You were created for eternity. God created you in his image to spend eternity with him. Those of us that are here that are, that are believers, having this eternal perspective changes everything. What I mean by that, it changes our relationships. You no longer have the luxury just to kind of, you know, keep things light and fluffy and be okay with that. What I'm realizing for me in my own life is that, and if I really love the people that God's put around me, I don't know Jesus, I, man, I, I can't really love them and care about them and not say anything. And I got two brother-in-laws specifically that every time we get together, it's, you know, the family gatherings, it's, you know, talking about uh, Zags basketball, talking about football, talking about fishing, maybe, maybe work a little bit, maybe family stuff, it's about the deepest it ever gets. I'm always looking to, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what's the, how can I take, you know, this conversation about Zags basketball and turn it to Jesus, right? How, how can I, how can I, that way? No, no. And here's what I'm concluding. There, there's no like clean way to do that. There's no like nice, neat way to do that. I mean, it's, it's abrupt. Jesus was abrupt, right? And, and what I'm recognizing is not, not coming from a place of just arrogance at all, but just from a place of looking him in the eye and saying, I, I cannot look at you and tell you that I love you and care about you and not tell you this. I recognize this might bring some tension in our relationship. I recognize we might believe different things, have different lifestyles, but I cannot tell you that I care about you and not share this with you. Because it's like this. If I'm standing on the sidewalk and you're out in the street and there's a truck barreling at you down the road, I'm yelling, hey, truck, hey, move, dude, truck, coming. There's a point where I start, stop talking, and I just flat out tackle you out of the way. This is bigger than that. This is eternity. Eternity at stake for the people around us that God has placed around us that we love and care about. And I might mess up. I don't know everything. I might fumble and not say the right thing, but I love you. I got to, I got to tell you this. We want to be a people that prays together. I love the way Devin said during communion that we want to, as a family, we're picking a fight. Picking a fight with the enemy that, that's held these people captive for too long or the world that's told them these lies. That just a little more of this, a little more of that, and you'll be good. We want to pick a fight with those that keep the ones we love separated from Jesus. When I'm talk, picking a fight, I'm talking spiritually. It's in the spiritual realm. Pushing back the gates of darkness. And so what we're going to do is we're going to respond as we close today during our time together. I'd love to do is to have the pastors, connect group leaders that are in the room. If you would come to the front, be available for prayer. Love to pray with any of us in the room that need prayer. What I mean by that is you recognize that the way you've been approaching God and his word is it's about you or trying to prove your point or justify your reasoning. Any of that, you need to repent. We want to pray with you. If you're in a spot and you don't know Jesus, we want to pray with you just help you walk through. We don't have it all figured out. We want to help you take that first step and just discover what that looks like. Or if you're in a spot today and you have people that you love and care about that do not know Jesus, we want to pray for them with you. We want to partner with you as a church, as really an army, as we're pushing back the gates of hell in this city around the hearts and the lives of people that we love. We want to partner together. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to stand to our feet and I would invite you to come forward and pray. Would you pray with me now? Jesus, you alone are God. God, thinking you are a good man, a good teacher, even a prophet sent by God, none of those things bring salvation. God, you are God. We confess that, we believe that. You are Lord, Master, and you are Savior. God, you save us from our sin, from ourselves. God, we need you. We are desperate for you. God, empower us to be your church, to be your people. God, we love you. We want to be used by you. Give us soft hearts. God, make us men and women that you can use, God. I know you, your will, you know, your plans will move forward regardless of me, but I don't want you to have to go around me. God, I want you to be able to use me. I want to be a man you can use. God, use us. God, equip us as an army, God, to, God, just to push back the gates of hell. God, we love you. We need you, in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing this song together. If you need to come forward and pray, please come now.